Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, MicroLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Center for Resilience, I would like to welcome you to our webinar on the economics of resilience. We're going to have a great discussion today about the benefits of investing in resilience, centered on a recent study commissioned by USAID on the economics of resilience to drought in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I will be your webinar facilitator today. So you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer session. Uh, we also have a team on hand from the KDAD project, our AV Tech, and a few others who will be engaging with you all uh, in the chat box today. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over just a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves. I see that many of you have done that already. And let us know uh, your organization and where you're joining from. It's always great to see that we've got people joining uh, from all different places around the world. And the chat box is your main way to communicate today. So we encourage you to use it to post questions at any time, share resources, and discuss the topic at hand with your colleagues. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer some of them along the way in the chat box as, um, as our presenters can get to them, and the rest will hold till after the presentations. You'll see that there are some resources available for download on the bottom left of your screen, so I encourage you to check those out. Those are the uh, reports from the study that we'll be discussing today. And lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we'll email you the recording, the transcript, and some additional resources once they are ready. All right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers, and then we can get started with our discussion on resilience. So first up will be Tiffany Griffin, who currently leads the resilience measurement, uh, oh yeah, um, monitoring, evaluation, and analysis work for the Center for Resilience at USAID. She has also served as monitoring, monitoring, uh, sorry, monitoring and evaluation specialist at USAID, supporting the Feed the Future initiative. And here, let me, um, apologies there, I wanted to make sure that Tiffany's face is on the screen. There, there we go, Tiffany Griffin. That will be our, our first speaker giving our introduction. Uh, and next up will be Courtney Cabot Benton, an independent consultant and international development economist who works with a range of donors, governments, and nonprofits around the world. And Courtney led the study on economics of resilience that we'll be discussing today. And then we'll also have Mark Lawrence, who is a PhD nutritionist with the Food Economy Group. He has been a leader in the development of household economy analysis, uh, which is used in the study that we'll be discussing today. And then uh, last but not least, we also have two uh, resources online to help us engage in the chat box, who are Tanya Boudreaux, also with the Food Economy Group as a partner, and Karine Garnier, who is a knowledge management specialist with the USAID Center for Resilience. So you'll probably see them um, engaging as well, and uh, Tanya may chime in verbally during the Q&A portion. All right, with that, I'd love to pass the microphone over to Tiffany to give an introduction to our webinar today. Tiffany? Thanks, Julie, and welcome everyone to this webinar on the economic value of resilient strengthening. Uh, as Julie mentioned, my name is Tiffany Griffin. Uh, I am the advisor for m and &E and Strategic Analysis at USAID Centers for Resilience. Um, I won't speak for too long, as we wanted the bulk of this webinar to be focused on the presentation and lots of healthy Q&A. Um, but I did just want to say a few words about the importance of the work that you're about to learn a little bit more about. So as we're all aware, resilience means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, um, and the reasons for applying resilience to our work are equally diverse. Uh, for us at USAID, we have a lengthy technical de definition, of course, but in practice, resilience is the ability to manage adversity and change without compromising future well-being. And you accomplish this ability to manage adversity and change um, by strengthening the strategies, assets, and resources people leverage in the face of shocks and stresses. So we believe that when you do this, when you strengthen people's ability to successfully manage potential or realize risks, at least three things will happen over time. First, you'll save lives. Uh, second, you'll strengthen the economies of the countries we're invested in um, through sustaining households' income, and that this will de facto strengthen the global economy. 
And third, you'll reduce humanitarian economic liabilities, so saving donors money and freeing up extremely limited resources for other demands in the system. But as we all know, believing that these, th that these three things will be accomplished when we strengthen resilience um, is not enough. It's not enough to just believe. Uh, we need evidence to back up these beliefs. And so at the Center for Resilience, we've committed to generating evidence that will uh, illuminate whether our theory is correct, whether these three things actually do happen when you strengthen resilience, and then hopefully strengthen um, how we program uh, accordingly. So today's webinar is focused on that third bucket that I mentioned, reducing humanitarian liabilities. There will, of course, always be disasters. And when they occur, we'll need to support the global community accordingly. But it's also our job to devise strategies that help our resources go farther and do more. Um, and we believe that by, by saving um, in the ways that Courtney and Mark will outline in just a second, uh, we'll be able to accomplish that. So with that, I just want to thank you all again for attending the webinar. We hope that you learn a ton. Uh, and we're really looking forward to engaging in some healthy dialogue after Courtney and Mark's presentation. So Courtney, over to you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. It means a lot. Um, we're really looking forward to presenting the key findings from this study and, and hearing your thoughts and feedback as well through the webinar. Um, I just want to give a few shout outs before I start on the presentation. Uh, first of all, this study is a collaboration with the Food Economy Group, and Mark Lawrence, who will be presenting in a bit, has undertaken extensive and detailed household economy analysis to underpin the economic models that we'll be presenting today. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be presenting with him, and this study would not have happened without Mark, so I just want to say a big thank you, and also to Tanya, who's on the call as well. And I also just want to emphasize um, that this study involves collaboration with a really uh, big range of agencies. So USA country teams, uh, WSP, FAO, UNICEF, Government of Kenya, so many different agencies provided details and evidence as well as peer review. Um, and also the HEA baseline data came from a range of agencies who have done so much work to collect this information, including USGS, FuseNet, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, Adesso, ActHead. So as you can see, this was a collaboration of, of many people. So I just want to say thank you for that. So we would like to initially take you through an overview at a very broad level of the study parameters and the key findings. And then we will dive more deeply into how ATA works and how we were able to use the models that we built uh, to look in more detail at how resilience building might work in practice. So the overall aim of the study was to compare the costs, avoided losses, and benefits of four scenarios. Um, the counterfactual models a lay humanitarian response. And this was then compared with a scenario where we assume that a humanitarian response arrives early, which we define as being before negative coping strategies have set in. We then built out a safety net scenario, which builds on the early response scenario, and assumes that a safety net transfer is made every year to all very poor and poor households, alongside an early response to any ongoing humanitarian need. And finally, we modeled a scenario, a resilient scenario, where we um, layered in an additional increase in household income on top of the safety net and early response scenario. And it's really important to note that this scenario is defined by the outcome. So we looked at an increase in income as a result of investment in resilience building. We didn't specify the activities that would lead to that change. And I'll talk about that a little more later on. We modeled these four scenarios across 15 years for a total population of 15 million people across 54 livelihood zones in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. And just to sort of put that in perspective, the 15 million people represent about a half to a third of the total population that's regularly impacted by drought in these three countries. 
So we can assume that the findings here would increase by an estimated two to three times if we extrapolated to the whole population. There we go. Um, our hypothesis, as, as Tiffany was talking to a bit, is that greater investment in early response and resilience building will lead to both direct cost savings for donors as well as reduced humanitarian need through smaller food deficits. And an early response here, as I just mentioned, is defined as taking place before negative coping strategies are um, employed, which also should lead to avoided losses. And these gains then help to unlock funds that can then be invested in more early action and resilience programming, which begins to hopefully yield a positive cycle of humanitarian assistance. We produced three estimates for this analysis, which I just want to go over briefly so that you get a sense of what some of the numbers mean. So the total net cost sums together the cost of humanitarian response plus the cost of programming over the 15 years. And this estimate uh, we really wanted to isolate because it shows how much a donor could save directly on humanitarian assistance costs. We then produced a second estimate where we adjusted this net cost for the transfer amount that is additional to household deficits. So the safety net scenario assumes that transfers are made to all very poor and poor households. And in the previous estimate, the, the total net cost, unadjusted, we assumed that um, the full cost of providing this transfer. But this does not reflect the benefit that arises from transferring more than a household needs. And we wanted to be sure to reflect both the cost and the benefit of the transfer amounts that were surplus to household deficits. So that's what this adjusted figure is representing. And then the third estimate um, in incorporates the benefits of investing in these different scenarios. So we were able to estimate in this study the changes in income and livestock holdings. Um, as an estimate of the avoided losses to households from a more proactive response. So the total net cost with benefit layers in these avoided losses, and those are offset against the cost. The next few slides I'm going to use to summarize the aggregate findings across all three countries. So this is for a population of 15 million people. Our key finding is that resilience building, in other words, the safety net combined with the improved income and the early response, would save upwards of $4.3 billion over a 15-year period. Another way of looking at that, the benefits of investing in resilience would yield, on average, across the three countries, $3 for every $1 spent. And if we break that down to look at the ratio of donor cost savings as it relates to the avoided losses at a household level, the humanitarian assistance cost represents 68% of the total savings, and avoided losses represents 32%. I would just caveat that ratio with the fact that we're obviously able to incorporate some significant um, areas of avoided losses for these households, but obviously there were lots of things that we could not monetize, which would push that 32% up. We then applied these savings to U.S government spending on humanitarian assistance in the region. So the USG spent $5.4 billion in these three countries over the last 15 years. And the analysis that we are presenting suggests that investing in a more proactive response would reduce the direct costs to international donors by 30%, which would be equivalent to savings of $1.6 billion for the USG. Uh, when avoided losses to the households are incorporated into this analysis, the savings increase to $4.2 billion. We also had a little look at how much the USG spends globally on humanitarian aid. Um, that's to the tune of $6.3 billion. And as we know, we spend about $20 billion on humanitarian assistance uh, each year in total, so just to give an idea of order of magnitude. These findings so far have focused on the resilience building scenario, but I also want to highlight um, that this scenario is specifically layering in increases in income with a safety net transfer on top of an early humanitarian response. And that early humanitarian response is estimated to save more than $100 million per year in aid costs alone. 
So I just want to emphasize that this isn't just about investing in resilience, but it's also about pairing this with mechanisms that can facilitate an early response to spikes in need. So this gives you the very high-level snapshot of the main findings of the report. And we want to now take you in a little bit deeper to the analysis that underlies these findings. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Mark, who's going to walk you through the HEA model. And then after he's had a chance to speak, I will pick up on some of the more nuanced findings in the different countries to give you a sense of what we were able to look at. So Mark, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, as Courtney says, I'm going to explain um, a little bit about household economy analysis, HEA, and how we've used it to model the impacts of the different scenarios on different types of household. HEA has been used in East Africa since the early 1990s, mainly for early warning and needs assessment activities. And it's been used by the USAID FuseNet project for the last 15 years. HEA baseline data is collected by a livelihood zone. And as Courtney said, we've looked at 54 livelihood zones covering a population of 15 million people. We've made use of existing baseline data. That there's been no new baseline data collection for this study. We focused on pastoral and agro-pastoral livelihood zones, as you can see from the map. Um, and that's because of the importance of livestock assets in these zones. And that links to the analysis of avoided losses. But we've also looked at agricultural areas in Tigray um, in northern Ethiopia. Um, HEA is a livelihoods-based analytical framework. There are two elements, the baseline analysis and the outcome analysis. For the baseline, we begin with a geographical zoning uh, by pattern of livelihood to generate the livelihood zone map. Then within each zone, we break the population down into four wealth groups from very poor to better off. And for each wealth group, we analyze livelihood strategies focusing on food and cash income and patterns of expenditure. For the outcome analysis, we typically uh, take data on a shock, such as a drought, and apply it to the baseline to assess the impact at household level. We can also look at the impact of positive interventions, such as a safety net or a resilience building project. So a little bit more about the outcome analysis here. From the baseline, we get data on the amount of food and cash income coming from different sources, from crops through livestock, as you can see here, labor up to self-employment. Self-employment includes things like um, firewood collection, um, charcoal selling, and so on. We can compare these estimates of income against two emergency intervention thresholds, the first of which is the survival threshold which is a measure of the um, level of income required to cover 100% of basic food needs. We have a second threshold, the livelihoods protection threshold, which is uh, a measure of the income required to sustain livelihoods in the short to medium term. So this threshold includes expenditure on um, agricultural inputs, for example. The first step in the outcome analysis is to superimpose the effect of the hazard in this case, a 60% loss of crop production. Income drops, as you can see here, below the survival threshold, giving us a survival deficit. The next step is to add in coping. In this example, we're looking at um, an increase in income from labor migration. Uh, and that leaves us with the final deficit, which in this case is a livelihoods protection deficit. Now, in this study, we have always measured the deficit against the livelihoods protection threshold. We've run outcome analyses to cover a total of 15 years, uh, 2001 to 2015. So in some of the graphs, you'll see one bar for each year, so a total of 15 bars. But in this case, um, we've split the year into two seasons, so we have a total of 30 analyses. Um, now, this is an example from southern Somalia, where there are two seasons which are called the, the goo and the dare. So we compare our 15-year sequence of income, income estimates that you can see here against the livelihoods protection threshold. 
um, to get the picture as far as the deficit is concerned. This tells us about the number of years or seasons in which there is a deficit and the magnitude of that deficit. We do this for each wealth group, which gives us the basis for totaling up the number of people facing a deficit. Now you'll notice that the livelihoods protection threshold changes from season to season and that's because of changes in the price of its component parts. Uh, we've made use of real data to generate the input into the model, that is data on crop production, on livestock production and on market prices. The crop production and market price data comes from existing monitoring systems and that data was provided by the FuseNet project. The livestock data comes from a livestock model um, which uses USGS satellite based estimates of rainfall um, as its input. Now a word about the early intervention scenario. So this scenario was based upon the monitoring data that I've just referred to uh, but makes um, a number of assumptions about the effect of early intervention um, some examples of which are given here. So if we start with crop production um, we have an assumption that if we intervene early this will result in a 10% increase in crop production in the post shock year so that's the year after it, we're seeing the shock and there's a rationale attached to this which is given below so we're assuming that if we intervene early then people will um, have less need to divert labour away from farming towards coping strategies such as firewood, firewood collection so they can focus more on their farming there we'll see an increase in labour productivity um, and an increase in expenditure on inputs as well now that's just one example another example then uh, on livestock production we've assumed that early intervention would result in a 5% decrease in livestock mortality Uh, and this it would be would result from higher expenditure on veterinary drugs and fodder and or water. The staple prices we've assumed a seven percent decrease in staple food prices paid, um, and this is linked to lower demand as food aid is distributed, and with early intervention as people are able to purchase before prices reach their peak. So these are these are, these are some examples of the types of um, assumptions we've made in developing our early intervention scenario but what I would say is that as much as possible we've tried to be conservative in these assumptions. So uh, before I hand you back to Courtney I just want to run quickly through once more how the analysis was pieced together. So for each livelihood zone, uh, for each wealth group in each livelihood zone um, we use the baseline and the monitoring data to estimate the total income from crops at household level. We then added milk and livestock sales and other sources of income, for example, casual labour and firewood selling. And we're always comparing that information against the livelihoods protection threshold. We then add in stocks and savings so there's a stocks and savings component of the model that's shown in red here and this represents the amount of income that is available that's carried over from the um, previous year into into the current year so if we look at the this very bad year of goo uh, dare sorry dare 2010 we can see that the model indicates that there would be some would have been some carryover from the two previous seasons which were both relatively good with income um, quite considerably above the livelihoods protection threshold. Finally uh, we can add in the effect of uh, an intervention for example a safety net transfer as in this case. So that gives us our, our final pic picture with, with the intervention added in. So now I'll hand you back to Courtney to continue. Thank you, Mark. That was really helpful. Um, so the HEA model gives us data, as you've seen, on the estimated number of people with a deficit, the size of that deficit, as well as estimated income and livestock holdings each year. And we then take that and 
create an economic model which combines this HEA data with data on the cost of response, the cost of programming, other factors such as multiplier impacts to estimate the cost and benefits of each scenario. So I now want to take you through some of the more detailed findings uh, with examples from each of the three study countries to show you how the modeling can provide insights of on response and what it might look like to have a so-called resilient population, uh, in other words, one that can cope without external assistance. So this first slide shows the HEA model over 15 years in Turkana in northern Kenya. Uh, the left side shows a very poor pastoral population, and the right side shows a very poor agro-pastoral population. As you can see, both populations are struggling to meet their livelihood protection thresholds in any year and are chronically in need of humanitarian assistance. When we layer in the safety net transfer, you can see how critical this support is to the pastoral group on the left. The red indicates savings, which is something that households can only do when they have income far enough above their livelihood protection threshold to begin to be able to save. And this ability to save is almost non-existent, suggesting that this population needs a much higher level of support if it is going to graduate. On the right, you can see that the agro-pastoral group has savings in most years. Whilst it's pretty minimal, it suggests that this group, with lots of caveats around ability to access markets and finance, et cetera, but that this group may be able to have a little bit extra to invest in productive activities that can grow over time. Um, a regular point of conversation as we were developing this study was around how we determine when people are resilient. So how long and how much investment is required and when is that tipping point? So we set up a thought experiment with our models. What if we gave every household a $450 investment fund in year one and this fund allowed households to invest in activities that yielded 30% income each year? The top graph shows a Somalia agro-pastoral zone uh, without the one-off investment fund. So the gray bar at the bottom of the graph represents the household sources of income, as Mark was just explaining. The blue bar represents the safety net transfer, and the red bar shows savings. And you can see the green line representing the livelihood protection threshold. Without the safety net, households have years both with a deficit and without. Uh, although the safety net is critical in most years to ensure that households stay above their livelihoods protection threshold. In the second graph, we see the same exact population, but now the yellow bar represents the investment income from that one-off transfer that we initiated in the first year of the model. In the case of this population, the safety net transfer, the blue bar, is no longer needed after three years. This population is able to cover their deficit in bad years with the income from good years, with the exception of 2010-2011, which was a bad year. Um, critically, investment in good years is vital to allow people to earn the income that they need to see themselves through the bad years. And I think that this point is a really important one because it highlights how fundamentally important it is to bridge the gap between humanitarian and development actors in these kinds of contexts. We now apply the same thought experiment to an agricultural zone in Tigray, Ethiopia. So as before, the first graph shows the household income represented by the gray bar, with the blue bar representing the safety net transfer. It's clear that the safety net transfer is fundamentally preventing households from a humanitarian crisis, but it is only thus raising them above their livelihoods protection threshold. In the second graph, we provide our one-off investment fund in year one, and in this case, households still require the safety net transfer for 10 years to prevent a food deficit. So this analysis raises some really important questions around the depth of support uh, that's required in these protracted contexts. Um, what type and level of investment do we need to make in Tigray in order to see people become resilient? What is the tipping point? Where does the cost of that investment become prohibitive? And 
certainly there are also questions around our assumptions on the level of investment that would be required to allow a 450 one-off investment fund to yield a 30% return. Is the infrastructure and access to market finance sufficient to allow households to generate these types of returns, and how much investment would be required to make this feasible? So I think this really starts to tease out um, some of the issues that are really specific to the local context around how we build resilience. We also were able to do a really interesting bit of analysis in Tigray. Um, so resilience is complex and multifaceted, and determining whether a household or community is resilient is hard to measure, and this analysis was really interesting because it really showed up that sometimes success might be measured as the disaster that never happened. So we had ATA baseline data from 2006 and from 2016. So Tanya and colleagues at the Food Economy Group were able to compare empirical evidence on how things have changed over this 10-year period. And one of these trends that immediately stood out was that yields had increased dramatically, in some cases by over 80%. But there was no change in household status. So why was this happening? Population growth had been so dramatic in Tigray over the same time period that whilst yields were increasing due to high investment and improved production techniques, land holdings had significantly decreased, effectively canceling each other out and meaning that people were no better off on the face of things. So we asked the question, what would have happened if there had been no investment in agricultural improvement? And we Mark built the 15-year ATA model using the data from the uh, baseline to reflect the scenario first with the agricultural investment and then compare that to see what would have happened to this population without the agricultural investment. We then built in the economics and cost of response and compared the two. And the model suggests that the improved agricultural yield saved over $1,500 per household on aid costs alone. That didn't even include the benefits to households. So while the investment in yield didn't appear to have made a difference on the face of things, this investment had clearly mitigated against a larger and much more expensive crisis. So I just want to walk you through um, some of the policy implications that come out of the work that we've done. First of all, clearly investment in resilience is more cost effective than providing ongoing humanitarian assistance. That was loud and clear across all of the country studies. Um, safety net and resilience building measures should be complemented by mechanisms to ensure an early response when there is a spike in need. And triggers for early response need to be based on a comprehensive seasonal assessment that considers multiple criteria. It was very clear that um, it wasn't just rainfall that was driving need. It was a combination of rainfall and price and other factors. Both consumption support and investment in productive activities are needed, but this differs depending on the context and requires a tailored approach. I think really important as well is one of the first questions that people ask me is, what does this mean for my investment? What package of interventions should I be investing in? And just to revisit a point that I made earlier, which is um, that this study does not, it models the outcome of an increase in household income. And household income could increase through a whole variety of measures. Uh, investment in health improvements could reduce household expenditures. A bursary scheme could mean that more kids are educated and are sending money home. A conflict resolution program could result in greater stability of household income. That could be investment in access to finance. You, you know, you get the idea. There are a myriad of possibilities. And this study expressly does not packages of measures can most affect cost effectively result in a change in household income. And further to this, that household needs are varied and they change in space and time. So trying to meet those needs with a set package of interventions or one particular strategy may not be so successful. And as we've seen in the findings, it really um, depends on, on the local context and livelihood as well. So I think one thing that came out of a lot of discussion is really that shock responsive and adaptive management approaches that 
can respond to the particular context and changing circumstances of households should help to realize outcomes most effectively. So I'm just going to give you six top takeaways um, and, and then present uh, a couple of sort of uh, forward-looking and, and food for thought kind of ideas that will hopefully feed into our Q&A and then we can go into um, a broader discussion. So our six top takeaways. Number one, investing proactively in people's resilience should be the priority. It will save 30% on donor costs alone, whilst also protecting billions of dollars of income and assets for those most affected. The second is that early humanitarian response is key, saving more than $100 million per year in aid costs alone, and those resources are critical to start to free up some of the pressure in the humanitarian system. The third um, is that investment, investment needs to go beyond direct transfers at scale. So the study highlights that investing in resilience, as defined in the study, is more cost effective than providing ongoing humanitarian assistance. However, that doesn't mean that providing, for example, direct transfers at scale is feasible, and it's really necessary to start to figure out what kinds of approaches can most cost effectively achieve these changes if they are going to be implemented at scale. Fourth, investing in good years is essential to mitigate deficits in bad years. In good years, households can generate the income that is required to see them through the bad years. And that seems obvious, but I think it's a really important point within the context of our discussions around bridging humanitarian and development actors um, and really comes out very visually in the study. Fifth, context is critical. The depth and breadth of support that is required varies depending on the livelihood zone, the degree of variability from year to year, uh, the level of poverty, et cetera. And finally, a focus on shock responsive and adaptive approaches to resilience is needed to allow for flexible responses depending on changing context. And last but not least, just some food for thought in case it's relevant or we can dive into other things, but um, a few things that struck us as we were working on this. These findings are highly relevant for slow onset or protracted crises, and we know that these represent a really significant portion of all crises. So how applicable are these findings in other contexts and countries? Can we apply similar rules of thumb? Do the costs and benefits of resilience change in other protracted contexts, or would we find similar things? How much can we extrapolate? Another point, the USG spent $6.3 billion on humanitarian assistance last year, and we spend around $20 billion every year across the whole system. So how would these savings manifest if applied to the whole system? Um, Yep. And then the third, should we be thinking about the best package of interventions or adaptive and agile programming? And if we're thinking about agile and adaptive programming, how do we track and measure that? And finally, how would these findings translate across to a conflict or refugee context? So we started to look at this a bit with Somalia, um, but weren't, we, we really stayed focused on the impact of the drought. But what do the costs and benefits look like in a conflict, conflict context? And how do we build resilience in this context? So with those points, I am going to hand over and open up for the moderators to lead us into questions and Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much to our presenters uh, for those excellent and thorough presentations. And thank you to our audience uh, for asking a lot of great questions. They've been rolling in over the past uh, 10 minutes or so. And so I'm going to um, go through them um, you know, as best as we can and see how many we can answer in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of run through them, mostly starting at the beginning um, from what first came in. And I'll throw them out to the presenters. I get the feeling that most of them are for you, Courtney, but um, Mark, uh, <laughs> uh, Tiffany, and Tanya, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll have places to jump in as well. And so um, going back, there were a few questions coming in from um, Elisa Wong, uh, Gilberto Amaya, and Sophie Javers about the safety nets. They wanted to know a little bit more about what 
uh, is the safety net transfer the only resilience intervention that the re research studied? And what exactly do you mean by safety nets? Were they transfer of cash versus input? Yeah, sure. So um, I think something that's important to keep in mind in this study is that any type of intervention that we looked at, we would ultimately have to monetize. So we weren't necessarily looking at um, specifically which interventions were the best approach, but rather if we were to provide, for example, in the case of the safety net, a stable income every year and account for the cost of doing that, does that, is that more expensive or less expensive than, um, than responding with humanitarian assistance? And that's not necessarily given. I didn't really go in, you know, we had our sort of theory of change in our hypotheses. I wasn't necessarily expecting, because safety nets can be quite expensive, that that would be um, necessarily a less expensive response. But it actually showed up as being significantly less expensive. And the way that we defined the safety nets, it was specific to each country. So for um, Kenya and Ethiopia, they obviously already have very large safety net transfer programs. In Kenya, if we uh, assumed that the safety net was delivered in cash, we used the um, already existing data on how much it costs to transfer that money based on um, the HSMP. Uh, similarly, for Ethiopia, we assumed that in that case that the transfer was made in, in food, but we then monetized that in terms of its cash equivalent in the economic model. Um, and in the Ethiopia analysis, if you download that report, you'll see that we also did some playing around with um, what the different cost scenarios would be and how much we could save if we were to actually shift to an entire cash-based response in Ethiopia, because we had really good data there, um, but that wasn't a core focus of the study overall. And, the, and then in Somalia, we used um, evidence from, because there's not a formalized safety net transfer program, we used evidence from the different uh, organizations that are doing safety net transfers on how much they transfer and how much that costs. And then we transfer those amounts to all very poor and poor households in our model um, to, to see what, what that looks like in terms of how much that offsets the humanitarian assistance that was required. I hope that answers the question. Tanya and Mark, is there anything I missed? Um, no, I, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I think, um, I think that was uh, good in terms of the perspective from the participants. Um, but of course, we always encourage you to keep chiming in if you have further clarifications on your questions. Um, and then I, I thought I'd also bring up, um, there seemed to be a little bit of confusion about the safety nets versus the resilience pieces. And um, uh, the broader question, of course, that others might need to chime in on, when you in suggest investing in resilience, can you be a little bit more specific about what actions are behind resilience investment, both what you chose to look at within the study and perhaps more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. So I, coming back to the, the first point that I was just making around um, the, the way that we treated resilience investment in this study. So um, I basically could choose to take 10 different interventions, whether they're fodder schemes or IGA schemes or health or education, whatever, whatever they were, and look at how much they cost to implement and what the benefits of those were and integrate each one separately into the model. But there, effectively, the way that you build the economic model is that you have to monetize the benefits of anything that you're investing in, whatever type of intervention it is. And so rather than saying, well, a fodder scheme might yield us $100 per household and a health intervention might yield us $50 per household and choosing lots of different price points, as it were, instead what we said was let's take, and it's a little bit different per study, but about a $125 to $150 increase in income, we aligned it to be 50% more than what they were getting with their safety net transfer. So we were basically saying, if you, in Kenya, for example, if you have a $300 safety net transfer, what if we also assume that a resilience building intervention is allowing your household income to go up by another $150? What does that then do? So if you now have $450 per household, what does that look like in terms of your household deficit and your income and assets? The difference in the economic model comes out where the safety net transfer 
obviously costs quite a lot because you have to pay for the full three hundred dollars plus the sixteen percent overhead to implement that safety net program. Whereas the additional hundred and fifty dollar change in household income, so for example in Kenya we looked at um, a women's graduation approach, a fodder approach, and I think the other one was doing vet services. I'd have to look back, I can't remember. I think there was also an agricultural approach where we had data on both the costs and the benefits of what it costs to invest in these resilience building measures. And they all averaged a return close to three to one. So for every dollar um, invested, you were yielding three dollars of benefit. So the extra income that came about was on top of the, so, so for example in Kenya, if you assume that each household has an extra $150 in income, but through a resilience building intervention, that it would cost us $50 to achieve that $150 increase in income. What one of the points that we really are trying to emphasize with this study is that if we haven't said which intervention is going to most cost effectively get you that extra income, that really is um, a, a whole nother um, year long, I don't know, five year long set of studies um, to try and figure out how you most cost effectively achieve changes in the household income. Um, but I think that the, the, what this study really highlights is that if we can start to build out this type of programming, it's clearly going to be a lot more cost effective than investing in humanitarian assistance. So let's start building out resilience programming and start to figure out what types of interventions are going to get there most effectively. And that's where um, the points around agile and adaptive management really came out, that it's quite hard to say this is what you should be investing in and you should take it to scale because as you saw from the second half of my presentation, the ability of people to invest in productive activities beyond their consumption needs is quite distinctly variable depending on which population you're looking at. Great, thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, another question came in from Michael Felix for you, asking, how do you view the current level of collaboration between safety net, humanitarian response, livelihood support actors and programs? To what extent is the level of collaboration a challenge to realizing some of the projected gains in coordinated and proactive investment? Oh, it's a great question. You're going to land me in it. This is all recorded. <laughs> um, the, I think what's really interesting is when you start to look at all of this through a political economy lens, and that's why I also, which speaks to the collaboration and the coordination point as well, and that's why um, I was really interested in some of the questions that I highlighted that roll out from some of the more specific analysis that we did around how do you actually build out um, the systems and infrastructure that can allow people to achieve these types of gains and is that feasible? So the idea that investing in resilience is far more cost effective than responding with humanitarian assistance still holds, but in certain contexts, yeah, and this really starts to bring up the question too of how do we um, address populations where it may not be feasible to continue um, engaging in that livelihood in that zone, how do you start to unpack that and figure out what the cost is to actually ensure that people can get the full amount of access to services, access to roads, access to markets that would be required to allow some of these shifts in household economies to take place. And so I, I think that there is, um, I, I've seen examples of both. I feel like I've definitely seen places where collaboration is working really well, and I've seen places where it's not working so well. We had a really um, interesting experience on a DFID project that we were working on in Ethiopia this year where we were asked to do a much deeper dive in collaboration with USAID as well to look at how the sort of um, network of resilience building interventions in Somali regions had contributed to people's resilience. And we couldn't even map the the different interventions that were taking place and where because it was so scattergun 
um, that there really was a total lack of coordination, and it meant that it was really kind of tinkering around the edges rather than creating a really concerted and comprehensive investment in building resilience. And, and so I think that that's where some of these bigger conversations around collaboration and um, and the, the sort of political economy of how do we get all these actors together and create this and level change need to take place. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we had a just a clarifying question uh, coming in from Dick Tinsley. Um, you mentioned carryover from good year good years to poor years, and he was wondering what form did this carryover take? Was it crop, livestock, cash, etc.? Mark, it might make sense for you to answer that in terms of how the, the yeah savings sure um, for the next year. Yeah, the savings were, were were either in food or cash, depending upon what was what you know what there was a surplus of so um if there was a if people ended the year with some of their crop production left over then that was stocked as food for the following year um otherwise by and large the savings were in cash that were carried over we, we didn't consider um anybody using that that, that cash to then invest and, and purchase additional livestock for example I, I think that's i think that's all i have to say on that Great. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a, a question that came in from Bernard Cartella. I think another clarifying question. Does early response mean early action based on outcome analysis, forecast, and triggers? And are those triggers predictive? Is that? I'm not sure I totally understand it. Mark, do you understand? Or, or perhaps if you could provide just a little bit more detail on on early response, the definition that you used for early response um, and what sort yeah, of sure. forecast so early was used response, for that? Yeah, and Mark, you can you can clarify. Early response effectively in the um, uh, analysis referred to um, action taking place before negative coping strategies started to kick in and then looking at what impact that had on the household economy. We weren't specifically layering in distinct early action measures. I'm wondering um, whether this is a question about the, you know, how Mark, effective our early that? warning is. Um, you know, I think the question here is if, if, if we do an outcome analysis to predict that there's a problem um, and we respond on that, you know, how, how many false positives do we get? Um, have you, I, you know, and, and the extent to that to which that might waste resources is that is that is that that's how I would see it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, it makes sense to me, but I wonder if the. I don't and, um, know. Maybe it's one where we need to get more clarification. Oh, well, and we can see that Bernard just commented in the chat box. He meant, is the early action far ahead of the shock, or the response is okay. provided at the earliest occurrence of the shock? Do you want to carry on? Yeah, no, it's a good Okay, no, I think that we we also thought in terms of time frame, right, didn't ahead. we? That um, a late intervention I, meant that the intervention occurred. Uh, in the last four months of the consumption year, so in, in, if you had a shock, uh, beginning with a you know failed harvest, for example, then a late intervention meant that there there wasn't an intervention until eight months after the harvest, whereas an early intervention we were thinking of something much more prompt. Um, certainly, we and, and before before any so after the failed harvest, but before we saw any negative coping strategies kicking in. So we were certainly thinking within within four months of, of a failed harvest. Yeah, and I think also it's important to highlight that um, this is a really tricky question and lots of people say how early is early, like when does that early response need to be? And we because we defined it as before negative coping strategies employed and before prices, prices start to destabilize in the market, you, you can't 
it does, we're not specifying when that happens in the seasonal calendar, although I'm sure if you spoke to local experts, they've ha they'd have a good sense of that. Um, again, pulling from the work that we've just been doing with DFID in, uh, in, in Somali zone in Ethiopia, it was interesting that um, the people there said that their crisis really started two years before AIDS started to flow. Um, so it, 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 which is tough because <laughs> there wasn't much chance of an early response that early. So, uh, so it's a good question, but I, don't, I think it's one that a lot of people are trying to answer. Great, thank you both. A question came in from uh, Peter Richards, which I think is uh, very straightforward and important to address. He said that much of the evidence uh, that you presented seems to be based on scenario modeling. Uh, to what extent have past investments in resilience led to cost savings in humanitarian aid? Or a, a related question, are there any gaps or areas that, for which there maybe isn't enough evidence that will require some further analysis? Yeah, brilliant. Peter, your question is spot on because um, we have, uh, you know, when we started out this study, we were very much trying to also see um, what kinds of evidence, empirical evidence, there were to help us understand whether investment in resilience had indeed offset humanitarian assistance. And in a second, Tiffany can probably give you a brief overview of some of the other work that USAID is doing that's trying to look at this. Um, the, it's a really tough question because, you know, sort of similar to the um, Tigray study where we couldn't, you wouldn't necessarily think people were more resilient unless you could have done that modeling. Um, it's very hard to tease apart whether an investment has empirically meant people have been able to cope better because the, for a whole variety of reasons, because trying to find areas that have a high intervention of resilience interventions versus a low intervention of resilience interventions is really difficult because so many people are doing so many things in so many different places. So it's very hard to get a clean um, sample and counterfactual. Also because the things that drive resilience are so varied and also because you resilience can show up in year one but can also show up in year five, it can show up in year 15. So it's very, very difficult to measure empirically. Um, I know from some of the work that DFID's been doing in Somalia, they have a three-year longitudinal study where they have found that people who, and they actually have a very clear, they've, they've been able to get a much cleaner sample of counterfactual and resilient communities. And um, they found that in last, this last year's drought that all of the um, counterfactual and all of the communities, sample communities, were in exactly the same place, that the high levels of resilience intervention had not helped in this drought. And there are a few other studies that echo that finding, but what a lot of people were sort of feeding back is, does that suggest that we're also, to, to sort of measure whether we're more resilient in one of the worst droughts on record might be a little bit ambitious. Um, and what they did see was that in other years that these households were definitely better off. So how do we, um, you know, like that Somalia graph that I showed where even with quite a lot of investment, there were still years where they got absolutely hammered um, in that 2010-2011. There's always going to be uh, droughts that overwhelm the capacity of the system to respond. Um, Tiffany, I don't know if you want to just give a few, a little bit of an overview because this is something you've been looking at a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't have any hard findings to that as of yet. Um, we have woven in some different measures of um, humanitarian assistance into uh, whether households have received humanitarian assistance into some of our recurrent monitoring. Um, the thing is we're not able to make the leap as to why certain households have, have or have not received uh, the humanitarian assistance. So is it an access issue? Is it a capital issue, kind of a social capital, human capital issue? So we're not, um, we're not comfortable making interpretive leaps as to some of the reasons why the different households received and didn't receive humanitarian assistance and then thus how the humanitarian assistance functioned 
in terms of protecting the households in the face of the shock. But we are working on different methodologies um, to capture that. And um, by using the recurrent, the recurrent monitoring uh, methodology, we are able to look at the timing um, of humanitarian assistance and kind of when, when it was received and whether earlier, um, earlier receipt uh, plays a more protective effect. It's early evidence is suggestive that it is, but again, it's nothing that um, is like totally sound and so that we would you know, put out there. Also, just to say that whilst we're doing scenario modeling, I just want to emphasize how much empirical evidence goes into this analysis. So the baseline data from, for the HEAs is extensive data from household community surveys and interviews that's used to build up the profile of these household economies and, and how they shift. Um, that's combined with actual data, as I was mentioning, from uh, FuseNet and the USGS and all these others on um, the last 15 years' worth of uh, price and rainfall and crop and livestock data. The economic model uses the actual data from WSP on the cost of um, purchasing humanitarian assistance at different times of the year and how that can shift depending on whether they respond early and therefore can reduce the cost is based on the actual cost of cash. The returns of investments on investments of, of investing in some of these uh, resilience investments is, is based on actual evidence from a wide range of agencies in each country on the specific costs and the resulting impact and benefits of their different types of intervention. So it's very, very heavily pinned in um, a lot of empirical evidence that we then use the model because it's so hard to um, tease out whether or not households will be more resilient with um, an investment, uh, sorry, whether they'll be have less need for humanitarian assistance with a resilience investment. Um, the model then really helps us to take all that data, that extra step to try and understand how things shift and over the other thing is that it's very hard you know we can't do a longitudinal study for 15 years and one of the things that we found really critical in the HEA analysis um, is that when you look at these populations over 15 years it's so fundamental what happened five years ago as to how they're coping this year so you really need that longitudinal understanding um, to, to paint the full picture. Wonderful thank you for those very helpful responses. A question came in from Lena Heron, who said that she understands the category of benefits was the avoidance of loss, but did you include an estimate of the multiplied wealth that can come from income that accrues to those assets that are not lost? Um, no, we did not, and we did talk about um, the idea as well that whilst we included an estimate of income is um, through the resilience building scenario, we assumed, you know, one of the limitations to the analysis that significantly more positive um, if we were to adjust this, but it was hard to adjust in the model, was that if, if uh, we were investing in these resilience building measures, that the outcomes from those should improve over time, whereas we assumed a static $150 every year. Um, but if people are, are sort of building out of poverty, you would assume that that would increase a little bit each year. So, no, we didn't Courtney, draft Courtney, if I can just jump in there, there is one category of income that we did take into account, and that was the, the, the livestock. So yes. if, you know, we had that assumption of a small reduction in mortality. Um, yes, that's true. Uh, and so livestock holdings increased uh, as a result of early intervention, not by a huge amount, but they did pr progressively over the 15 years, and, and, and that did then result in an increase in livestock income between the two scenarios. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's see, we've got about uh, 20 more minutes for questions, so please do keep them coming. We will get to as many as we can over the next 20 minutes, but if there's some that we're not able to get to, we will also follow up as best we can via AgriLinks and via the post-event email that we will send to all of you who joined the webinar today. 
All right, let's jump to a question that came in from Richard Schullerton, uh, who wanted to ask about how we factor in disaster risk reduction. Your analysis focuses, or focuses on income and transfers, but disaster risk reduction would reduce the impacts of shocks and reduce the resilience and survival deficits that households face. He notes that it's been hard to integrate this into cost-benefit analysis, given the diversity of disaster risk reduction actions and the lack of real evidence on how much they reduce the impacts of shocks. Um, so he's wondering what new ideas or progress has been made in disaster risk reduction. So I guess, I mean, we did, we basically were looking at if we were, I, I think it somewhat depends on how you define disaster risk reduction as compared with um, resilience building. But effectively what we were looking at was if we improved um, household, household income by a certain amount of money, how much would that offset the deficits that that household faces? And um, we're also, because we're rolling from year to year, we're able to see how a lack of a deficit in a previous year allows you to then cope in the next year. So there is somewhat of a rollover from year to year as well. Um, so I think, I mean, if you were, if you're investing in disaster risk reduction, you're obviously going to be having a similar impact. So in theory, if your if your disaster risk reduction intervention is successful then your income and asset loss won't be so significant. And therefore, you that again, that would translate into the same modality as we've already used in the model, which is if we invest and our income and asset changes by $300, what does that do to the household? So I don't, the model didn't specifically tease out what, or, or compare how a disaster risk intervention would compare with a resilience intervention, and 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 underneath each of those, obviously, there's quite a few different interventions that could be considered. We didn't compare which ones would get us um, most cost effectively to the outcome that we predicted. Um, so I don't know if it. I and Richard, we can also chat um, offline anyway later about this, but I don't know that it added specifically, but I don't know if I'm getting at your specific question um, and maybe misunderstanding of it. I can see that Richard is, oh, it's typing. I was going to see if he had some <laughs> But he just says, thanks, Courtney. Excellent. And it sounds like you can okay. connect further as needed. He's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, let's see. Um, a nice question came in from Ryan Huddle who pointed out that this is largely an econometric measure of resilience and does not look at environmental health, gender equity, or other fairly important factors. His question is, have you been working on any predictive modeling that helps identify best bets in terms of interventions, safety nets, improved practices, et cetera? And I'm assuming he means some best bets, kind of considering that there are all these other complicating factors. Um, in, in the resilience measuring? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And that's why I pointed out on that slide um, that shows the breakdown of donor costs compared with avoided losses, that really the avoided losses, we were able to isolate a couple of really big important factors for um, the, the household. So it's certainly not insubst insubstantial, but obviously there are many other forms of benefit. Um, that we couldn't quantify or monetize to include in the analysis. And that would absolutely include some of the things that you're talking about that would hopefully help to push along um, the, the, the progress on resilience faster than we're able to achieve it in our model. So the good news is that means that the findings from the model are conservative and there's lots more that could go in there um, that would be really important if we had better evidence to quantify it. I do think, again, though, that coming back to, like, what are the best bets of interventions, I, most of my career I've spent looking at the costs and benefits of different types of interventions. And one of the things that consistently comes out is that most of the things that we consider to invest in are typically cost-effective. Normally the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, but what really 
impact, whether or not they actually achieve that impact in practice, is, is how, they're in, how they're implemented. So where I've been asked to do an economic analysis of interventions that really have not achieved what we would have thought they would be able to achieve, it's because they weren't um, built up from a community-driven perspective. And I think that um, shifting, that, that's why this point around agile and adaptive programming is so important, because we still tend to take such a sector focus on our different types of interventions, whether it's savings or gender equality or an environmental intervention or health intervention. Um, as opposed to, and I think the World Humanitarian Summit has helped to really open the conversation around investing more in local actors. I think the cash conversation has really helped to show up the, the real diversity and how households spend their money in, in order to be able to cope. And so I think that um, from my perspective, from what I've seen in, in the economic evidence, the best bets are the things that allow the communities to drive their development that allow um, donors and NGOs to be flexible uh, and shift when shocks rise or spikes in need come about or context changes and people need access to other things to get them through whatever is happening. Um, I think that that flexibility is, is, is pretty critical and I think that's certainly where people like DFID have been trying to drive with some of their work on multi-year humanitarian financing and, and um, cash-based agendas, et cetera. Um, so I don't, I, you know, that I, as I said in the presentation, the, one of the most common questions is, okay, but so where do we put our money? What, what interventions are going to get us the farthest along the fastest? And um, it, it's, uh, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than our current conversations and that there needs to be a much more focused um, approach around flexible, um, agile, adaptive, shock responsive. I can't think of what other labels have been given to it with those kinds of approaches. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I would like to quickly uh, call out for our participants that April Thompson just posted in the chat box a really useful guidance document on resilience that for those who need a bit more of a, a primer or primer, depending on how you pronounce it, on uh, resilience and how it relates to the relatively new U.S. global food security strategy, um, please visit that link and be sure to read that document. I'd, uh, we still have a few more minutes for questions, but I'd also like to just quickly pull out uh, and point out some coming attractions for AgriLinks and MicroLinks. We actually have a webinar next Wednesday, January 31st, on trade-based solutions to food insecurity, uh, where we'll be looking at grain trade, uh, interregional trade in Africa. So that should be interesting to some of you. Uh, we also have a event, probably an in-person event, coming up in late February um, with the U.S. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance on seed storage and marketing. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that. And of course, um, AgriLinks has been doing theme months, and our current theme month is Water for Food. And our, um, we've got some other theme months coming up on, um, let's see, next month is finance-focused month. And we also have food safety coming up in March. So um, you will get updates on all of that if you are on the AgriLinks mailing list, which I hope many of you are, are on AgriLinks and or the MicroLinks mailing list. Um, so please do sign up if you're, if you're not a member already. All right. Um, so we do have about 10 more minutes left for questions. And so I'll, um, let's see, I'll toss it to a question from Ian Winborn that perhaps might be uh, good for Tiffany to chime in on. Uh, just a frank question that given the traditional programmatic divides between humanitarian aid and development, uh, program resilience in a mission, I'm assuming he means a USAID mission, looks like a great challenge. What are your thoughts? Hi, Ian. This is uh, Tiffany. Thanks, Julie, for passing this very difficult question to me. Um, <laughs> no, I think, uh, you know, to keep it very frank, um, I think it can be a challenge, but I think we have really great models for um, overcoming that challenge, you know, within USAID. So I think one thing that is uh, an opportunity that resilience affords is that it's not 
going to be strengthened. Resilience is not going to be strengthened through any one sector or any one technical intervention. Um, and it's not achieved through any one time frame, right? So you need immediate, um, immediate responses. You need long-term responses, mid-term, um, you know, mid-length responses, and so on and so forth. So because of the complexity of resilience, it affords an opportunity for um, strange bedfellows, if you will. It uh, brings together different sectors, of course, different technical sectors within development, but it also requires humanitarian and development actors to work together such that you know, humanitarian responses um, strengthen development over time and don't undermine development and that de development similarly doesn't you know, create situations by which humanitarian liabilities increase over time. And so one of our really great examples of collaboration across offices and across that humanitarian and development divide is actually in Kenya, where they kind of brought together a number of actors, both on the humanitarian side and on the development side, um, in addition to local government, national government, so different, different actors from the entire system, if you will, working towards the same goal in a specified geographic area. We found that when you kind of create that atmosphere of everyone working towards the same goal um, and identify how each actor, be it on you know, whatever side, the humanitarian side or the development side, um, how they contribute to that goal uh, and what synergies emerge when they're all contributing towards that goal, that actually the collaboration um, kind of fuels itself and it need not be as complicated um, or complex as it may seem on face value. So is it challenging at times or can it be challenging? Absolutely. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. And we have some, um, some examples of it working really, really well. Wonderful. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, as you all can see, we have a few polls that have come up on our screen, our exit polls that we always ask you to fill out if possible before you leave the webinar. Um, a few questions that will just help us uh, scope and improve our future events. So please do answer those if you have a moment. And um, let's see, we can probably squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll jump down to one from Daniel Bailey who wanted to bring up remittances. He asked, was there also an evaluation of private cash transfers, in other words, remittances, and how did levels of remittances impact the resilience effects? Was that considered? That's a great question. Um, Mark, do you want to speak first yeah, about sure. how remittances play into well, the Well, yes. Uh, I mean, if um, there is remittance income, then that does form part of the of the baseline. Um, so we, we do collect information about uh, which which wealth groups receive um, remittances in any given livelihood zone and how much remittance income they might receive in the year. And we also have, an you know, we make some kind of an evaluation as to by how much that might increase uh, in a bad year as a coping strategy. So all of those things are, are factored in to the the HEA side of the analysis, um, but uh, we, we didn't consider them as as a, a component of the response in the same way as we did, you know, looking at the safety nets or the resilience projects. Uh, uh, do you want to add anything to that? No. But again, I mean, yeah, no, that, and I would just add to that, that again, coming back to this point, that we weren't specifying what the um, source of or the intervention was that led to the increase in income at a household level, but obviously remittances from family could easily be one of their coping strategies. So you, you could um, surmise that if you had a very strong remittance culture, if you were in the Philippines, say, and you were looking at this, um, that that could be the, the quote, intervention that's boosting up um, the, the income to allow them to offset the humanitarian deficit. But it, it, it does come through in the HEA in the sense that that would have been captured in any baseline data. Great, thank you. 
Um, let's see, I'd like to just call out a couple of questions from Rebecca Chaco, who was interested in some more detail about the assumptions and models around early humanitarian assistance. Um, and also a breakdown of costs for each of the scenarios, the four scenarios that you mentioned. Uh, for example, for the final scenario, how much is spent on the late humanitarian assistance, on early humanitarian assistance, on safety net and resilience? Uh, I know we might not have time to fully answer those, but perhaps you could explain what exactly people can find within the various uh, downloadable reports and whether that sort of detail is in there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think if you go onto the website where all of the reports are located at, at the Center for Resilience, you'll see there's both the overall summary report as well as the HEA report. So the HEA report will have really detailed ex explanations around the assumptions um, that were included uh, for that portion of the model, and then um, including you know how we how much every component of the model shifted depending on which scenario we were looking at. And then um, the overall report for each country will have the specifics for each country and their very detailed um, tables in each of the country reports that spell out the assumptions, the costs used, et cetera, for each of the scenarios. Um, and it also gives a breakdown of the cost for each scenario. So please have a look at those. And I'm really happy for anyone to email me and jump on a call to talk through in more detail if you don't see there what you need. But there's a lot of information already in there. All right. And then this perhaps hopefully will be a, a quick question from Carlos Celaya. Did you have any experience with local institutional models of carryover, like savings groups, et cetera. I'm not sure whether that's been already partly addressed, but I wanted to, to call it out. Yeah, I mean, again, we didn't integrate these. It, it's pretty hard to integrate a very specific type of intervention like that into the model, particularly because there are so many. Um, but obviously, you, in order for the savings, in the years where people are able to top out enough that they have savings, in order for that to then be invested in productive activities, you would assume that there would be, you'd need to invest in um, packages of interventions that include savings groups so that they can carry over their savings or access to some sort of um, banking facilities. You would assume that they would need to then be able to invest that in a productive activity and what do you need to have in place in order for that to happen? Is it already there or isn't it? Um, so we didn't we we assumed that people would be able to carry over their savings to the next year. Um, but to be fair also in a lot of the cases that savings was pretty minimal. Great, thank you. And um, a question, it just came in from Rick Hammock, and I, I think it's interesting to note, how does the, the 3 to 1 ratio, the $3 to $1, compare to previous or other estimates that you're aware of? He says it seems like a smaller difference than he's seen in the past, but um, I was wondering if you know of other similar studies that might have different results, um, or whether there haven't been quite enough that have been in this exact same vein. Yeah, so um, the so so I think there's two points here. The first, the three to one is very similar. This study was preceded by a study that I did with DFID four years ago, which was quite well received and, and um, helped to kind of push the agenda forward. And a lot of people quoted the returns, the the cost um, to benefits cost ratio from that study as well. And this this is this study went a lot, a lot, a lot deeper with a lot more data, a lot more nuance, um, and it has yielded similar benefits cost ratios. They're not smaller, they're on, on par. What I would highlight though is that this three to one is the um, cost, it, it's the benefit that arises through avoided humanitarian assistance from investing in resilience. And that's a different beast entirely to what are all of the benefits that come from investing in um, a resilience intervention? So if, for instance, you were, look, you were to look at an intervention around education, 
you would actually be quantifying not only how much does that intervention offset the humanitarian needs of that household, which is what this three to one is, but you would also be incorporating the fact that there are um, benefits in terms of long-term income gains, in terms of, I mean, all the different benefits that roll out of an educational investment or a health investment. So this is, this, if, if you're thinking of, you know, like the four to one, which is what the World Bank tends to use, and I think they just decided to increase it to five to one, um, that's looking at a much broader set of benefits. Here, we're really isolating what is the effect of the resilience intervention on humanitarian assistance needs, and that's a, a very important piece of the puzzle. But so, so again, though, positively, it means that what we're assuming is conservative. If you were then to roll in all of the benefits that would additionally come outside of hum the humanitarian sphere, the wider development benefits from these resilience interventions, obviously that ratio would go up quite significantly. Great, and I think um, there's just one last punctuating question from Sophie Javers, who notes that this is very important research and wants to know what are the future plans to bring this research to an even broader development audience beyond this webinar. Stephanie, do you want to answer that? <laughs> Hi, yeah, so we have, um, I don't know if it's listed in the resources or somewhere on the slide um, uh, where folks can access the um, access the the actual studies um, that led to this specific presentation um, but that is that is where you would get the actual studies and then you know beyond beyond this webinar we'll keep you know working to refine the models and then hopefully, um, as a comment that arose earlier alluded to, um, you know, apply the thinking of value for money to more empirical kind of real-time analyses. So those are the plans in place so far. Great. Well, uh, we are at uh, our official end time, and so I would like to extend a sincere thank you to our presenters, Tiffany, Mark, uh, and Courtney, and of course our, our resources who have also been helping um, answer questions and in the chat box, the KDAD team, Kareen, uh, and Tanya. And um, most importantly, though, thank you to you, our participants, for joining the webinar, for asking such great questions and sharing resources, engaging in the chat box. You are the reason that we hold AgriLinks and MicroLinks webinars. So thank you very much for attending. Please continue to uh, tell us what interests you and attend our webinars in the future. Um, and be on the lookout, of course, for the recording of this webinar. Perhaps part of what we can do to keep the momentum rolling is for you to share this with your colleagues who you think uh, would be interested. So that the email with the recording will also contain links to all of the uh, studies that Tiffany just mentioned, the, the official reports. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, and hopefully we'll see you at future AgroLinks and MicroLinks webinars. Thank you all very much, and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>